An old timey woodworker knows a thing or two about saws. How does Roy Underhill do it? Actually, there's more than a thing or two to know about saws. It's more like a thing or two bazillion. But an old timey woodworker isn't afraid to apply himself to a little bit of book learning or even video learning until he's mastered the art of the handsaw in all its toothy glory. And that's what we'll be doing this time on the Old Timey Workshop. These kids today with their power saws and their fancy doodads. If saws were meant to be round, God wouldn't have invented the saw plate, or the brass back, or the sweet comfort of a perfectly formed apple wood handle. That's the closest thing to heaven right there. Hand saws are an old timey woodworker's bread and butter, his mashed potatoes and gravy, his bourbon and ice. Asking an old timey woodworker to make something without a hand saw Maybe like asking your kid to have a conversation without a little keyboard in his hands. It's just not possible. So pull up a saw bench and we'll get started. What's that? You don't have a saw bench? You don't even know what a saw bench is? You saw a bench at the park but it was covered with bird poop? I can see I got my work cut out for me today. A saw bench is an old timey woodworker's bread and butter. His mashed potatoes and gravy. If it sounds like I'm repeating myself, it's to make two very important points. First, old timey woodworkers love their mashed potatoes and gravy. And second, the saw bench is one of the most useful fixtures in any shop. A saw bench is the woodworking bench's little brother. It's smaller than you are, you can pound on it all you want, and it's a great place to sit down and eat your lunch. They come in all shapes and sizes and styles, and once you build one, you'll wonder how you ever got along without it. As you can see, a saw bench is much more comfortable to sit on than the full-size bench. But there's a lot of very specific features that a saw bench has that you can't get anywhere else. First of all, a saw bench height should be customized to the woodworker. The top should be right below your kneecaps because your knee becomes your hold down when you're sawing. And if you're doing a big long rip cut, you don't want to be in an awkward position for like 10-15 minutes. Second, a saw bench has a handy dandy little split of some sort in the top to make rip cuts easier. Now, my particular bench is an adaptation of the traditional design. On one end, we do have something similar to a V, which is a feature of those traditional benches. It's designed to support smaller pieces for ripping without cutting into your bench. But it also makes a handy dandy little holding spot for things like frame and panel doors or stuff like that when you want to stand them on the end and plane down the top edge. A more modern design is the complete split top, which makes it easier to rip long boards without cutting into your bench. I like that design but I also like the holding features of the older style. So I'm gonna incorporate both into my bench. Who's gonna stop me? Of course, this makes my bench a little bit longer than some of the others out there, but there's a reason for that too. You see, a lot of old timey woodworking tasks are best done sitting down. And the shaving horse used to be the place where you did your tasks. The back of the shaving horse seat would have things like holes for bench hooks and all that stuff but not every woodworker has room in a shop for a great big shaving horse and if you don't make chairs you're probably not going to use it anyway so i decided to add those little features to my saw bench you know what the best part is you can make this whole thing with just a couple of two by sixes and one two by four it only costs like 10 bucks brilliant eh <laughs> now let's quit messing around and get to the building Now I did say I like my saw bench to be a little long, but don't get carried away. You're gonna want it small enough that you can stick it in a corner somewhere and get it out of the way when you're not using it, especially if you've got a small shop like I do. For me, three feet is just about right. So I got some two by sixes and I cut a couple three foot chunks. I also cut four 19 inch long chunks. Why 19 inches? Well, it's because I took my ruler and I measured from the floor up to my kneecap and it turned out to be 19 inches which I believe is the perfect kneecap height for an old-timey woodworker. You should probably measure yours to be sure. Your 2x6s probably aren't very flat, and every old-timey woodworker knows just what to do with a fat. You get out your hand plane, and you get to work on them. 
You don't want any bows or twists or wanes or anything like that, but they don't have to be perfectly flat. Plus, I like to take it down enough that I can get rid of those rounded edges that make a 2x8 look like a 2x8, you know what I mean? Now we're going to have to cut some dovetails, which I know could be a pretty scary thought for some woodworkers. Don't worry, I'm going to walk you right through it. But if you need to take a minute, go psych yourself up, vomit, whatever it is you have to do, go take care of it now. I'm going to head over to Pappy Nub's tool chest and grab a couple saws. Good old Pappy Nubs. He was a man of many saws. Some of them I got hanging on my wall, others are in boxes in the crawl space. But one of my favorites is right here in his tool chest. This is maybe one of the earliest spear back saws ever made, perhaps from the late 1700s. Pappy carried this saw with him during the War of 1812, and it said that while cannonballs were bouncing off old iron sides, Pappy took this saw in his teeth and swam just below the surface of the water to all the ships, cutting holes in their hulls and sinking the entire British Armada. I guess that's why the plate's rusty. Of course, this is a back saw, which means it has a metal stiffener along the back, which makes it possible to use a very thin blade and produce crisp, accurate cuts. Some might call this one a dovetail saw. Others would say it's a carcass saw. In fact, there are several classifications of back saws, and it's not always clear where a particular one fits in. So let me give you a quick rundown. As a joiner, which is what old-timey furniture makers were called, you had at least four classes of back saws at your disposal and selecting the right saw for the right joint, well, sometimes that was just a matter of personal preference. The smallest of these is the dovetail saw. These are usually between six and 10 inches from toe to heel. They have fine teeth, 15 or more per inch, and they're filed for a rip cut. They have a very thin plate that's only as wide as it has to be for dovetail cutting because they can easily kink. That and the fact that hand cut dovetails are considered to be fine woodworking joints have made these saws sort of a status symbol among woodworkers, even old timey guys. Next comes the carcass saw, which was used to cut up the cow for the old timey woodworkers lunch. But its name actually comes from the fact that this saw was used on the structural pieces of the furniture, the skeleton so to speak. I don't know, it's a pretty dumb name. But it's my favorite of the back saws. They're usually 12 to 14 inches long with relatively fine teeth. Mine are 12 points per inch, others like them about 14 points. The carcass saw is most commonly filed for a cross cut, but I keep two of them, one for cross cuts and one for rip cuts, because I find this saw to be just the perfect size for cutting small tenons and even dovetails in thicker material. The next size up is the sash saw. These are the conundrums of the handsaw world. If you go ask a woodworker today in one of the forums what a sash saw is, you may as well be walking into a bar and yelling Harley suck. A fight is gonna commence. Old timey days saw the sash saw as the workhorse of the workshop. A lot of woodworkers used it for everything. They're kind of a hybrid between a carcass saw and a tenon saw. They're 14 to 18 inches long with about 11 to 14 points per inch. But the teeth are filed in a very specific way so that it can do both rip cuts and cross cuts. They've kind of fallen out of favor nowadays, but some woodworkers actually prefer the sash saw for tenon cutting rather than the larger tenon saw. Of course, that brings us to the largest of the four back saws in the Old Timey Woodworkers Toolkit, the tenon saw. And they have one purpose, to cut fine, intricate dovetails. That doesn't sound right, does it? Actually, the tenon saw is the anti-dovetail saw. It's big, heavy, and long, 16 to 20 inches with coarse 10 points per inch filed in a rip cut. These are made for cutting the cheeks of tenons, so they have an extra wide plate. Unless I'm cutting some really heavy duty tenons, I find these a little unwieldy. But for many woodworkers, this is their bread and butter. Their mashed potatoes and, did I already say that? If I know anything about old timey woodworkers, it's that they would have loved the new StumpyNubs.com. This website has everything from new episodes of all the popular Stumpy Nub shows, video tips, tricks and reviews, project plans, and Stumpy side splitting blog. I have to say, I peed my pants a little. Sign up for the newsletter and don't miss a thing. 
Time to make the dovetails. <laughs> Get it? It's like the old timey Dunkin' Donut commercials. <laughs> Except dovetails, not donuts. Now that you're an expert on all the back saws, you're probably expecting me to just whip out a dovetail saw and lay right into this 2x6. Well, you couldn't be more wrong. A 2x6 is a little too thick for a dovetail saw with that fine teeth. When I'm cutting this much meat, I like to use my carcass saw. In our last two episodes, we made a couple of tools that you're gonna to need to lay out your dovetail, the marking gauge and the marking knife. See, there is a reason why the show's laid out the way it is. I'm not just making stuff up willy-nilly here. We set our marking gauge to the thickness of our leg and mark all the way around the ends of the mating top piece. The traditional angle for a dovetail in softwood is 1 6, which means you take your bevel gauge and you line it up on the 1 and the 6 on your carpenter square. Really, you don't have to use a bevel gauge to mark the angles on dovetails like these. If you've cut a few dovetails in the past, you could probably just eyeball the angle. But I still like to mark mine out. I do, however, eyeball the spacing because with only two tails per joint, it's pretty hard to mess that up. If you're new to dovetailing, this project is great because it's not a piece of fine furniture. There's no pressure to get them perfect. sharp chisels for dovetails, especially in soft wood because a dull chisel is just going to mash it. And I like to carve a little shoulder to keep the chisel from pushing backward across the line as I chop, especially on my show side. Now this is why you can just eyeball the angles when you're cutting the tails, because even if you're not exact, you're custom cutting your pins to match those tails. So any errors are going to be compensated for. If you want to learn more about hand cutting dovetails, check out Blue Collar Woodworking Season 1, Episode 12 over at StumpyNubs.com. <laughs> the moment of truth always comes when it's time to put your joint together, and I bet you're dying to do it. But don't do it just yet. A dovetail always fits best the first time it's assembled, and you still have to cut the tails on the other ends of your top pieces and we'll have some tenons on the other ends of the leg pieces. So rather than putting them all together and then taking them apart and back and forth and all that stuff, just hold your horses. I'm gonna go get a cold one and be right back and we'll talk tenons. Love to watch Stumpy make a fool of himself? Then you should join him on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and of course, StumpyNubs.com. An old timey woodworker's back saws are for joinery. But when fast cutting and dimensioning of stock needs doing, he turns to his panel saw. Technically, the term panel saw refers to just short hand saws, like under 20 inches. But I have a hard enough time remembering all the classifications from the back saws, and I think hand saw is just too general a term, so I call any saw with the back a panel saw. I'm just nutty that way. When I was a kid, there was only one of these saws in the garage, and this is it. My great-grandfather painted everything blue. I did everything with this saw. I didn't know at the time if it was rip or cross cut because I didn't know there was a difference. And if you'd asked me how many points per inch, I'd have thrown it down on the floor and ran away because that sounds like crazy comic talk. But the fact is, teeth, shape, and count are everything when it comes to panel saws. And an old timey woodworker likes to have a good selection on hand so he has the right saw for the job. Now you already know the difference between cross cut and rip teeth. So let's consider points per inch. A good rule of thumb for rip saws is to have four to eight teeth inside the wood during any cut. That means a one inch board is best cut with a saw with four to eight points per inch. A three quarter inch board is best with a six to 10 points per inch saw and a half inch board with eight to 12 points per inch. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you need a different saw for every board. That can get a little expensive. An eight points per inch blade fits into all these thicknesses. So for many rip cuts, that's a good general purpose saw. Of course, if you use a lot of thin stock, you may want to also pick up a 12 point saw. And if you want to rip thicker stock fast, consider a four point saw. 
When it comes to cross-cut saws, the rules change a bit because cutting across the fibers can cause a lot of tear up. So you want a less aggressive cut. The rule of thumb here is six to 10 teeth within the wood during the cut. That means six to 10 points per inch for a one inch board, eight to 12 for a three quarter inch board, and 10 to 14 for a half inch board. If you want a good all purpose saw, go with the 10 points per inch because it fits in all the categories. For finer work or a lot of thin stock, it pays to add a 14 point saw to your set. And for rough cross cutting without messing around, it's good to pick up a six tooth saw. The bottom line is you can get away with just two panel saws but it's good to have six or even more. And since saws are a dime a dozen at yard sales and flea markets, it won't be long until you have way more than you'll ever use. While you were off captivated by my lesson on panel saws, I was cutting the rest of my dovetails and thinking that I probably should have told you you should number your mating pieces for your dovetails so you don't get them all mixed up later. So why don't you go ahead and do that? Now it's time to talk some tenants. The mortise and tenon joint is the most important joint in all of woodworking, and anyone who says differently is lying to you, and you really shouldn't be hanging out with that type of person. They're stronger than an ox, and they're prettier too when they're properly done. Every good tenon starts with a mortise engage, so it's a good thing we made a couple in our last episode, eh? Normally, you'd set your gauge to the width of your mortising chisel, but we're going to do things a little differently this time. Set your pins to an inch apart, and your fence a quarter inch from the pins. We're going to make our tenons two and a half inches long. So you can mark your shoulder first with uh, another marking gauge, or you can measure it out with the ruler and mark it off with the pry square. When I'm making any saw cut that I want to be right along the line like this, I always cut a little notch just like I did with the chisel on the dovetails. This creates a shoulder for your saw to start without skipping across the line. And if it's going to be a through tenon with a visible end, I also cut a groove all the way down the end grain. This gives me a crisp edge and helps the saw to track accurately since it will naturally want to follow the path of least resistance. To cut a tenon, you want to angle the piece away from you so you have a good view of the line on this side of the board. As you cut, you want to follow that line while also keeping an eye on the line across the end grain until you get down to your shoulder. Then we flip the piece around in the vise and do the same thing on the other side. To cross cut the shoulders, we can use the same trick with the chisel or marking knife before we make our cut. It's also important with any cut to keep the saw perpendicular to the workpiece. You can do this very accurately with your eye if you just sight down the blade, kind of looking at both sides of the plate at once. And with your thumb against the plate, that can help you guide the cut as well. These one inch wide tenons are going to fit into our feet, and of course we're going to make our feet out of 18 inch long pieces of two by six. You're gonna need two of those, one for each foot. Now, most mortises are bored out and then chopped to square. But in this case, we're gonna do stuff a little bit differently. We're gonna cut half our mortise at a time. And I'm not talking about top half, bottom half. I'm talking about right half, left half. Now remember which legs are which because you want to keep all of your mating dovetails together and get the right legs on the right feet. So these are the two legs that go with this foot. I know I want them about an inch and a half apart so I'll use a two by six scrap as a spacer and I want this roughly centered on the foot. Now I can mark the sides of my half mortises. Some back saws come with depth stops. You can even make your own depth stop, which is actually a project that we'll probably do in a future episode. But this time, we're going to do it the hard way. We'll use a marking gauge to just mark a line where we want to stop cutting, and we'll be careful not to cross our lines. You want to mark that line half the thickness of the tenon. So in this case, it's a half inch. Now we want to cut a series of curves down to the lines we made with our marking gauges. This might be a little intimidating because you're afraid you're going to cross the line, but do it a lot like you did the tenon. Cut at an angle down to your line on one side, and then turn the board around and cut at an angle down to the line on the other side, and then cut out the middle. Do several curves about an inch apart, and then we're gonna chop them up. Don't try splitting out all this waste at once. You'll end up splitting deeper than you want. 
better to do like a third and then do a little bit more and then finish off at the line than to split it out and ruin the whole project. Then you can smooth things out with a nice wide slick or a wide chisel or even a hand plane or if you're a real old timey woodworker you can use a skewed rabbit plane. Now it's time to rip it right down the middle so that we have two pieces that are two and a half inches wide. And by gluing our two halves together, we have a delicious mortise sandwich. But hold the mayo, and of course by mayo, I mean glue. Because now is an opportunity to fix any mistakes that you might have made. Specifically, if your tenon is too thick. You can glean that baby up with the hand plane, get yourself a nice perfect fit, and then glue your two halves together. But don't glue the tenon into the mortise yet, Mr. Anxious. We'll get to that right after the feet dry overnight. We want this bench to be really stable, and the best way to do that is to draw board these tents. And to do that, it's not as intimidating as it sounds. In fact, it could be easier. Actually, it could be easier, but we're woodworkers. I mean, come on, suck it up. First thing you want to do is to drill your holes. Get yourself a drill bit about an eighth of an inch, and decide where you want your pegs to be. I suggest two pegs for each tenon. Find a nice, pretty place to put them, and drill a 1 8 inch hole right straight down through the outer surface of your foot. Then dry fit your tenons. Take that same drill bit and put it through the hole and just make a little mark on the end of each tenon. Pull your tenons out and the actual spot to bore your full size hole is not going to be where that little mark is but about a sixteenth of an inch or maybe 3 30 seconds below the mark. So, get a drill bit to match your peg size. I recommend hardwood pegs because you're going to be pounding on the ends of these things and pine will probably just split on you. Drill your hole straight through your tenon. Do it on both of them. Then you're going to fit your tenons right back into your mortise this time use glue and sharpen yourself up a couple of pegs for each tenon. You want to sharpen them kind of like a pencil. Of course you don't need a pencil sharpener in an old timey workshop, you can just use a chisel. Then you're going to pound those babies right into your holes and as you do that point will find the little offset hole in the tenon and force those tenons right down into a locked position tighter than you could ever do it by hand. These babies are never coming apart. And now that we've started assembling, why stop now? Let's get our dovetails together. That's one good looking bench if I do say so myself. I spared you a couple of the construction details but I'll fill you in on them. That uh, little uh, piece that fills in that split top, that was just a 2x2. Two two. It's about 12 inches long and I just glued it in. I also drilled some 3 quarter inch holes in the top that uh, will fit bench hooks, things like that. Um, the position really isn't that important. I'll probably get working and wish I had one somewhere else and I'll just bore another hole. I also made some lateral supports out of some 2x4s. Now you can put this on any way you want. I just did another simple dovetail and these are actually the easiest dovetails you're ever going to do. You just cut the tail on the end of the 2x4 and uh, trace it on the edge of your 2x6 leg and chop out or cut your hole and then just chop it out and it goes really fast just be careful you don't split too much pop them in one on each side and that gives you a lot of um, protection against it racking from side to side motion this sucker is rock solid of course the best thing to do with one of these saw benches is just sit back on them sure beats sitting on that bench 
That about wraps things up for this episode of the Old Timey Workshop. Tune in next time as we'll be taking our tools and skills that we've been learning a step further. I think we're going to be making something like a shaker clock. That ought to be fun. If you're a power tool guy, check out stumpynubs.com where you can see the latest episode of Blue Collar Woodworking. And don't forget to check out Mustache Mike's Corner at stumpynubs.com as well. Until then, you can sit back and have yourself a cold one. Did you ever end it, my friend?